So welcome to our Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where I'm very excited today to be talking to Beatrice Williams. I'm so happy to be here. I know, this is going to be really fun. She's our guest, and we're going to be talking about a lot of books today. Because a lot we, to get through, yes. You've had a busy year. You've just I had a have. really busy year. <laughs> I know, and I have four kids, and I you know, dropped one off at college. So, uh, you know, it just gets easier. So it's only three now. It just gets easier, only right? Three, but only now three. I've suddenly got all this college to pay for. So please buy all the books. <laughs> please buy all the books. Everything that we're talking about today. <laughs> so as I was playing this interview, I realized that the three books we we're going to talk about is, first of all, The Golden Hour, which I think has the most stunning cover. I absolutely I just lovely over this yes, cover. I totally do. And then we're going to be talking about The Wicked Redhead, which is out in December. And then we're going to have a little sneak peek chat about the ways we said goodbye, which are the books that she writes, three books, the third book now, that she writes with Karen White and Lauren Willick. Yes. So, got a lot of ground to cover today. <sighs> you know? Yes. Are Not as much as actually that? writing them, Not but so. yes. Yes, a lot. Well, I'll also talk about it. So, you clearly have a lot going on in a short time. Let's start with The Golden Hour. Mm -hmm. And... As I said, I love the cover. So tell us about it. What drew you to write this one? So it was my editor, actually. And, and this is actually the first time I've had sort of an editor-led book. Uh, and I, I shouldn't say that she sort of demanded I write this. But uh, my husband and I were headed to the Bahamas for, it was actually, our, we have four kids. Mm -hmm. And this is when my oldest was in high school. And this was the first time we had ever been away together alone for the weekend. So we go to the Bahamas to go visit. He's got a friend who lives there. And, uh, and so my editor was like, oh, I've always wanted one of my authors to write a book that's set in the Bahamas during the Second World War. So of course I'm like, well, why? And she said, well, didn't you know the Duke of Windsor was governor of the islands during the Second World War? So Edward and Wallace, you know, one of the most iconic couples of the 20th century, were there, uh, and it's the Second World War. They've kind of been sent there to keep them out of trouble because they, <laughs> as yeah, we know, else. <laughs> some Nazi connections there. Not that anyone's accusing them of disloyalty, but they just, it was just better if they were out of the picture. So they sent them to the Bahamas for the duration of the war, almost like an exile. Uh, and while they were there, as I'm sort of doing this research, it turns out one of the most notorious unsolved murders mm -hmm. of the entire 20th century occurred uh, in the Bahamas while they were there. There was a big cover-up, sort of a fall guy who nearly got convicted. Luckily, the jury was smart enough to, uh, to acquit him. Uh, so all this stuff is going on, and you, of course, you've got like spies who are trying to get to all kinds of stuff going on. So that actually... This is a really good setting for a book. That so is. that's kind of the backdrop. My, fic my, my main character is fictional, okay. um, but like with most of my books, there's a dual uh, storyline. There's another narrative that takes place uh, 40 years earlier, uh, previous generation, uh, that's a little bit connected to a book I wrote earlier, Along the Infinite Sea. So it's, but it all kind of comes together in the end. I just love because when I, as I was sitting there, I was reading it. I thought, first of all, Nassau in the, during the war, I had not thought about this at all. Completely I about, different from how it is today. And I hadn't thought about the islands at mm -hmm. all. I hadn't thought about any of the characters. I hadn't thought about Wallace, you know, the, being down there, the mm -hmm. whole family, all that. I hadn't thought about anything. And it's like you just brought it completely to light and full frame. Yes. You also wrote off the trip, right? Oh, no. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I, I could, there was some suggestion that, oh, well, you should go to the Bahamas, go back <laughs> to the Bahamas and do all this research. But it has completely changed yeah, since then. Um, you know, one of the sort of side characters in this book is a real historical figure. His name is Axel Wintergren, uh, sort of the founder of Electrolux, so vacuum cleaners. He was a very wealthy man. And he owned, he had a house, he sort of owned this private island near Nassau called Hog Island. And it was sort of him living there in this estate. Well, that is now known as Paradise Island. Oh, really? Yeah, it's okay. at the big resort and everything. So that's how much Nassau has changed. Uh, and the other thing about Nassau in World War II is like the war, I mean, yes, there was obviously a lot going on and they had all these fundraisers and Red Cross and so on, but it, obviously the war isn't taking place there. You're very mm -hmm. removed from what's going on. So with all the World War II books out there, and this is the first one I've actually set during the war, this is... If you're looking for something that's not, you know, uh, set in France, you know, the, the, you, you know the, 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 the book, there's so many books out there and there's a lot of sort of Europe set books uh, during the Second World War. This is kind of not that book at all. It's sort of like some, where the war, 
kind of a, a backwater of of the Second World War. Of what happened, and, and yet life was going on, and I think that's what I found life so interesting. Life was really going on, yeah. Is, they were still untouched, really. They were untouched. They were getting news, but mm -hmm. they were getting it in little drips and drabs. Exactly. Because it wasn't exactly like, well, the news isn't like the news is today exactly. at all. Exactly. But you really, I, I agree with you. When you think about places in different time frames, I mean, I've always wanted to set a book in Key West. I always thought that would yes. be a really great location. But Key West in 1978 and Key West now are completely different places oh totally and as you think yeah. of any of these resort places it's not the same it, it's it, it's a really a post-war thing where you know the middle classes were suddenly going on vacation so that's right uh, these places changed so much over those decades and and you know NASA they, they did build a uh, an airstrip there that was a sort of an important uh, uh, sort of waypost for uh, pilots uh, to, you know taking bombers overseas and so on so it was an important air base in the Bahamas but that was kind of it. it was, they, certainly nothing was being fought there. They did have rationing and shortages and, you know, all this, as I said, Red Cross stuff going on that the, the Duchess was deeply involved in. And for all we can say about Wallace, and she certainly has her fans and her detractors, and she has her, uh, her strengths and her weaknesses, she was deeply involved in the charity effort, mm -hmm. both uh, in trying to improve the Bahamas economically and you know that the sort of the war effort side and and she was deeply involved she did do a lot of good work and this that was a mission of hers actually it was. Like say, but on a social side on a How social can we have a side party because, to raise money uh, yeah and and also well they, and they, they were they did not want to go to the bahamas the mm -hmm. two of them this was mm -hmm. not their thing they were you know she called it a dump in private letters she was not thrilled about it at all I uh, didn't like the weather. This was pre-air conditioning. So, mm -hmm. you know, didn't did not love the Bahamas, but saw this as a dress rehearsal. Like, if we do a really good job here in the Bahamas, then maybe we'll get something a little more prestigious, like governor of, say, Canada right. <laughs> uh, my, or, or, or Australia. So they were kind of gunning for one of those big offices. Uh, and, of course, that never happened. Mm. It's almost pathetic what happens to them in the ensuing decades, because the, that this is the last job Edward ever has right. is governor of the Bahamas, and then he's got the rest of his life to live, and we sort of see uh, how much that life is really wasted. Yeah, and and it was also he left for a reason that now you would never have to leave office. You wouldn't have to, and well, now you said no. I, my argument is that he didn't really want the job. Oh, uh, that's and yeah. and it he, he sort of I think a lot of his sort of single-minded ambition to marry Wallace. Not that he wasn't completely in love with her because he was. Uh, a lot of it had to do with, oh, this is kind of about the only way I can get out of this and still not be reviled by history is, oh, true love, I'm sacrificing my crown. I don't think it was a huge sacrifice. He did not love the work side of things at all. He liked his privileges, but was not too fond of, you know, getting that annoying red dispatch box delivered right, to him every right. day with all the secret papers he would leave scattered around, you know, the drawing room while his German friends were wandering around, you know. So he was not a great king and he was never going to be a great king. Right. And uh, I think he kind of recognized that this was not the life for him. And, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously, this did make a pretty nice way out. Wallace certainly didn't want to get married. She was like, mm. I kind of like my job the way it is. I kind of like this. this is I know, I, this is, I know. I, it's not a lot of work involved and plenty of, of parties. Exactly. Parties and socializing. Plenty of privilege. So. so the story's set in two time frames, and mm. you do that a lot. You do the dual yes. time frames. What intrigues you about writing in the dual time frames? I think, and you know, this is somebody you know, speaking, I am a lifelong history fanatic. I have always been deeply interested in history. And I think if you are, if you have that passion, uh, you tend to sort of see history as just kind of a piece of ourselves. And that sort of interaction between past and present, between generations, and how you know, the actions of one generation reverberate down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that sort of dialogue between past and present is to me so fascinating. Uh, I almost, it's very hard for me to envision a book where the story of your parents is kind of also the story of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by, in this case, you know, the, the, the other uh, narrative is about the mother uh, and father of one of the characters uh, in the main narrative that takes place in the Bahamas. Uh, and how they sort of combine together in the end, uh, I think. To, I, I think we all have that desire to feel, 
you know, to use the modern word closure, to mm -hmm. feel that, you know, it's all kind of tending toward a natural and, and sort of just resolution. And that kind of allows me to do that in a much wider, more sort of epic feeling way. And you can also try to understand what happened before and place it exactly. in this other spot later yeah. on. And that's what I found was, when I was reading is any, any of your books, you okay, these, there's a common thread that's going through mm -hmm. here of good and bad. Yeah. And what is going to impact both ways of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, your book contains a description of one of my favorite times of day, absolutely oh. five, which is the golden hour. Yes. And I'm going to read this because when I read this line, I remember exactly where I was sitting. I was out on my patio mm. on, and, and I said, this is my favorite And was favorite it the golden time. hour? And it was the golden, it was hour. the golden hour. The golden hour when I was reading it. <laughs> I have a lot of Instagram people are like, golden <laughs> hour at the golden hour. I'm like, I love it. It's so beautiful. So fabulous. It's when everything looks the most beautiful just before the sun sets. This luminous air turning everything to gold and then it's gone. Just like that. The sun disappears and the night arrives. And it really catches the specialness of that hour. Mm. When um, I was working in a magazine, that's when we shot a lot of pictures. You yes. shot at sunrise uh -huh. and you shot during the golden hour. Exactly. Because the light was perfect. It's so the light luminous. was right. So it's actually my daughter who suggested the title. My daughter is uh, 16, just turned 17. And uh, we were trying to think of a title for the book, and my original idea was. Um, uh, the hour before sunset or something like that and and they were like that's really depressing uh, <laughs> so uh, they, they need something a little more positive and my daughter and of course all her friends that's when they bring out their phone cameras to do their Instagram shots so okay. like oh it's the golden hour they all whip their phones out and I'm like hmm the, the golden gold. hour that's a positive spin on the same idea that's right the last hour of sunlight was my original title this is obviously a much more positive spin right, on, right. on the same idea. So it, it is. It's just like rich, but then it gave them the opportunity to do this with the cover, with the I mean, everything in the cover, gold inside on the page, like inside. It's oh, just beautiful. Yes, it's just just beautiful. Voice seems to be something that really is important to you yes. when you're writing your books. Yes. And while I feel that it's the voice that makes your writing so special, mm -hmm. in every one of the books, I can actually hear the characters because you're so crystal clear on the way you're writing them. Is that a passion of yours? Absolutely. I think for me, it is the, really the starting point for every character. And whenever I'm struggling with a character, it's because I'm not hearing their voice mm -hmm. in my head. And uh, it, it's vital to me. And I've kind of tried to piece together, well, why is this something that is so important to me? Um, I think when I was a kid, uh, my parents just took me to a lot of what you might call performance storytelling, theater and opera. I mean, our vacation, our family vacation, everyone else, I was on the West Coast, everyone else got to go to Hawaii or to Ocean Shores or something along the Oregon coast. And we went to Ashland, Oregon. There's a Shakespeare festival every year there uh, that's done in this replica of the Globe. I'm not even kidding. It was built in 1936, replica of the Globe Theater in like Southern Oregon, uh, in the wow. middle of yeah, the foothills of the Siskiyou. You would never think, not think this at all. And some of the most amazing. But so year after year, as a child, from the age of five, we went to the Tempest and to Taming of the Shrew. That year, we were considered too young to go see Richard the Third, which, which is <laughs> remarkably, you know, a restraint on my my parents' part. But uh, so uh, constantly through childhood. You know, I, I sort of was exposed to that storytelling, and I think my natural uh, sort of default move when I'm writing a book is to just be in a scene. Mm -hmm. And yes, there might be a flashback thought or experience, or they might sort of summarize something that happened earlier, but I always want to be in a scene, inside a scene. And then the dialogue has to have that sort of sense of actors speaking lines, mm -hmm. and, and, and it has to be in character. and. Uh, so it's just something that kind of comes down, and of course, I think it helps. I'm writing in a period where we have an amazing filmography. So, you know, as I love, I'm passionate about old movies, vintage movies. So I, I've had so much exposure to how people smoke. Uh, I say, actually, that's an interesting mistake. I just said smoked because they also smoked <laughs> while they were speaking, <laughs> spoke and, 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 and interacted with each other, accents. Uh, and, and characters and, and, and all of that. So it all kind of folds together to me. Uh, and I, I did also do some acting when I was in high school. Uh, so that thing of being in character, uh, I feel like when I am writing a character, I am in character. It's like method writing, maybe, I don't know what it is. I just take all that persona. I think the most important thing we can do as writers is to slip the reader inside the skin of another human being. Mm -hmm. 
So, Great and who might be it. nothing like you. And why mm. else do we read? I don't read books to sort of relate to people. I want to find out about how how life is lived uh, from another's experience. And, and to me, that's what the whole process of writing is about. Uh, and, and so in order to do that for the reader, to make them feel as if they are living or existing or seeing the world from inside somebody else, uh, right. I have to do that as a writer. I have to be inside that character's skin as I'm writing that character. So what comes out is, is, is what I think the character would say as I sort of take on the persona of that character writing it. Yeah, it's very visual writing. I mean, really, you're, you're seeing the character, but you also have this way of writing. There's, um, there's a structure to it that you actually feel the pacing of the mm -hmm. way the character would be speaking as well. And I, I definitely am seeing that come across at the same time. Oh, thank Besides you. just description of place, mm -hmm. which is also very rich. I mean, we're definitely seeing the Bahamas mm -hmm. as you're going through here. But sometimes place gets in the way of the character. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel that, I feel your characters are like front and center and strong. Mm -hmm. And it's like really, really nice to see. Well, I try to make my characters part of that sense of setting. I think if you make the characters <sighs> part of the world that you're building. So you make the voice of the character helps to put you in the time period. If you mm -hmm. get it right, I think for me what's jarring is if you're reading fiction where the person isn't really speaking as someone would speak in that period. Or, or we want to be virtuous and sort of have that person take on the characteristics of, of sort of a modern person and the way that you know, a modern person would think and look at the world, and and it might be more palatable, but it's not very authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's obviously a very fine line you have to walk in historical fiction because you don't want to completely turn people off. But I feel like voice and character is a tool that I have in my toolbox to take you back into that era and to do it very efficiently. So mm -hmm. I don't need to describe stuff as much. I just. It's more of an immersion thing where they're saying it. They're, exactly. they're, they're talking about what's going to happen instead of just pulling something out of a tray. Exactly. They're discussing to what's going take on. Take that one detail that turns the whole world into color. Right. And also, you're right, period speak is completely different, but yeah. you don't get caught up in that halting kind of a yes. thing. You don't feel like you're in like, yes, my darling, come into yeah, the home. Yeah, people didn't you know? speak stiffly to each other. No, there's this notion. Think this we is. think they do because we read novels and, you know, it's I do not instead of I don't. But they would have said I do. I mean, it's, it's not, people didn't actually speak the way it's read in the way you read it in a novel. I think you sort of have to... Uh, interpret, uh, interpret them. So these are human beings just like us. And there were lots of emotion that was going on, mm -hmm. even though emotion is subjugated more, like during those times. Mm -hmm. They were not talking about every subject the way we do yes. now. Yes. It was not, you know, let's do this. So the book has a storyline in the 1900s, another one in World War II. Did you do separate research for each? Do you research at the same time the whole topic, or do you research first and then write? Uh, I research first and then write, I, but, but the, the research I do, so I, I kind of do research during both times, but the research I do while I'm writing is definitely more detail specific. Okay. So I'll go and look up restaurant menus in, you know, 1938 uh, in New York, you know, for example. I see the tomato aspect was really on the exactly. menu. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. So those little details are how much did a telephone call cost from a payphone and, and those sorts of things, how much to write a ferry. I don't know. Those details I will look up as I go along. Um, the research I do beforehand is more of both the big picture, sort of biographies, and then I dig up all the primary sources I can, uh, and, and also just, uh, you know, historical works about whatever particular place I'm in. Because as, as I've just said, you know, the world was a different place. You can't just yeah. travel to, particularly a country that has undergone so much rebuilding and change uh, and just sort of assume that it was that way before. It's one hurricane away from being different again. Well, exactly. And that's the whole thing. You know, uh, so, uh, so, so I do that kind of research and then, and then I focus more on details while I'm actually writing. Now, in the case of, and, and always uh, when I'm writing these books, uh, I write each narrative in its entirety. So I first wrote the oh, uh, nice, yeah. 1900 uh, narrative and from, from start to finish, and then I wove the Bahamas narrative around that uh, because I needed to know what had happened in the past before I could understand my characters and their point of view in, 
in, you know, in the Bahamas in, in the 1940s. So when you, when you, the thread is tying, but you're starting with one, writing the complete story, then dropping the other in, and then writing what's actually happening later on during World War yeah, II. Yeah, so, so, so I'll, I'll write, I wrote sort of Lulu's story after mm -hmm. I wrote Elfrida's story. Got it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, to me, it, that's just sort of the natural way you would write it in order to sort of, you've solved the mystery in the past, and then mm -hmm. your characters are reacting against that. But uh, actually, Karen and Lauren, my co my writing partners, they actually write, you know, each chapter alternately. They sort of write it, you know, in the order that is read yes, by the reader. Right, right, right. I think whatever works for you. But uh, I, I think one of the reasons, I, I think it's partly a voice issue because I need to be immersed in that character's voice to, you know, to sort of feel that authenticity throughout uh, that narrative. And if I take a break and switch into someone else's voice, it's a bit harder for me to get back into it again for that Makes chapter. Sense. So to me, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like each side is its own whole story. And so I want to tell that story from beginning to end and then... Are you making notes the for the other one at the same time, though? In my head. Okay, but not writing down. A little mm -hmm. bit in my... Yeah, a little bit written down. But, you know, I, I, I didn't... And, and this was actually a stumbling block for me because I, I wrote Elfrida's story first. And when I came to write Lulu's story, I knew all these details about the Bahamas and I had this idea of... The plot was going to kind of revolve around this Harry Oaks murder. But then I sat down to actually write it, and I was like, I haven't even thought about my character yet. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've sort of thought about the story and the setting and these very vibrant, you know, secondary characters, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, but I don't know who, who, who is this, who is Lulu? Who's Lulu? Lulu. Right. And I actually had a lot of false starts. I had a few months of flailing around thinking, oh my God, I've lost it, and I'm going to have to you know, fake my own death and move to <laughs> the other side of the world. I can't do this. What's happened? I could, because Elfrida's story just poured from me. It was just one of those wonderfully easy, not easy in the sense of easy, easy, but it was a very natural fit for me. Her story just really flowed. So all of a sudden, it was just like there was a slamming on of the brakes as I tried to like, start the Bahamas. Hey, like, here we wait go. a minute, yeah, exactly. I, who is this person? And having to relearn a whole sort of character that I hadn't even thought about yet. So, if I uh, remember right, the book opens with Lulu, though, doesn't it? it? So well, it, it does. does. So yes. Yeah, so what happens is, you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had Elfrida's story existing, and then I wrote Lulu's. You know, I, they, were, they were already broken up into chapters. So I would start Lulu's chapter, and then I. And it, but it's so funny because when you read the opener, which is very compelling, right from the beginning. You would never think that Lulu was not the one you had thought of first because yeah, you well, just come in there and you're like, wow, this is like really yeah. your inner head. You're, yeah. And then you're like, wait a second, that's kind of interesting to hear that mm -hmm. the method behind what really was going on. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Well, it's you know, and each book is different, but I think part of it was that I had never, and and certainly Lulu's, you know, narrative. Uh, is so historically specific and deals with a lot of actual historical events that were happening at the time, even though Lulu herself is a fictional character. Uh, that was the first time I tackled something that was that historically specific, where mm -hmm. I couldn't just imagine everything. Right. I had certain things that I couldn't change, uh, and my story had to wrap around that rather than, you know, fitting the, you know, sort of having the story whole and sort of having the the history be sort of the setting behind it. History were the little tendrils here. The history had to be the root of what yeah, was going yeah, on. Yeah, the actual events, I couldn't, there was stuff I just couldn't make up because right. I was dealing with real people who actually existed. And so. real times. Yeah. So now let's turn, because we have this whole book that we've chatted about. Let's talk about the Wicked Redhead. Yes. And the one thing I'm seeing, it's a Wicked City mystery. So is this going to be a series? There, I know there's it one is a on series. So, uh, and 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 most of my books, uh, as many of my longtime readers know, uh, they are standalone books. Mm -hmm. But there's all these characters who sort of pop up in different uh, in different books. Who uh, might be a main character in one book and then be a secondary character in another book. There could uh, be a pop quiz on your website. There about really that. could. There really could you know, be. Like, I hide which a lot books, of books. Blah blah blah. Yeah, I know. Lots. Uh, I actually do have a family tree. Uh, so that you can kind of see where people are connected, which which helps because I, you know, these are my books. So for me, it's like you wouldn't forget who your cousin is. But obviously, I understand that my readers do occasionally read other books <laughs> uh, and maybe aren't quite as you know up to date. They're not completely on exactly. who cousin who is. It, That's you know? okay. I understand. But um, but I did so when I when I first had the idea for the Wicked City, which was I wanted to sit something in prohibition. Uh, because I'd done all this research into prohibition for an earlier 1920s book, A Certain Age. Mm -hmm. 
And I got the idea for the Wicked City uh, and I thought it would be really great to actually make this a series. So we follow these two characters, this uh, red-headed flapper from Appalachia who ends up in New York City uh, in the 1920s and this prohibition agent who's very much a straight arrow type uh, who is, you know, who needs her help to help uh, to help sort of nail this, this, uh, this bootlegger. So I wanted to make it a long running series so that we could kind of go through prohibition from sort of early years mm -hmm. to the end because it's such a big, complicated, fascinating subject. The fact that we stopped selling booze in this country for uh, a long time. Exactly, for over a decade <laughs> right. is kind of amazing, especially considering you think about it, the twenties was kind of the decade we needed it most coming out of, you know, World War One. Uh, and of course people didn't stop drinking. Uh, but it went underground and with all kinds of different social implications that then yeah you know, reverberated down the decades since. So uh, so it's a and, and, and against the backdrop in general the nineteen twenties where you have widespread proliferation of things like automobiles and radios and the mass media market and you know women getting the right to vote and and, and suddenly having starting to lead much more independent lives, so much is going on in the 1920s. I thought this would make a great series. I've mm -hmm. just got so much material here. So, and I've got this character that I love. So I introduced Jen Kelly mm -hmm. uh, in this book, and she is maybe one of my most vibrant and I guess voicey yes. uh, characters. Yes. <laughs> She's got a very distinctive voice. She's got great chemistry uh, with uh, with. Uh, Oliver, well, he's, he sort of goes under a, a fake name for a while. So Oliver Anson Marshall, who is connected to the family in a certain age, which was my first 1920s book. So I knew all along there were going to be more books. Uh, and we had this ambitious plan for a while that we we're going to do two books a year. And I'd have my summer book, which would be like the golden hour. And then I'd have a Wicked City book in the winter. Uh, and then we just quickly realized that wasn't going to be feasible from a marketing standpoint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so I had already written uh, The Wicked Redhead. Uh, so we just kind of had to wait to release it for uh, a bit longer. So it's it's out uh, in December, December, right? And very excited. About this. I I love these characters so much. And of course, also like my other books, there is a dual narrative. Uh, we also go to 1998 Manhattan and a young woman uh, named uh, named Ella who's uh, just discovered that her husband's been cheating on her. So she's left her marriage winds up in this West Village apartment that, of course, was once inhabited by a certain red-headed flapper. Uh, so there's this interaction between past and present, but also Ella, um, she is from the same family that were, were sort of my earlier books, uh, the Schuyler family. Mm. So many readers have wanted more sisters. about yes. this family. So Ella is kind of my bridge to the Schuylers. It's like all these Schuyler epilogues that are taking place. So her uh, her two aunts are, or actually three aunts, are, are Tiny and uh, and Vivian and Pepper from my Schuyler sister books. So they make all these cameos and we see Aunt Julie who is, so you don't have to have read any of these books uh, to appreciate. Yeah, it works as a standalone. The wicked, it it totally does. does. But uh, if you have read and loved the earlier Schuyler books, you'd be like, oh, there's Aunt Julie again. And, and isn't she a hoot at, you know, in her 90s out uh, at this uh, retirement home in, uh, in the Hamptons. So the two stories interact, and, and, and this is the second. I still have, you know, more in my head. Um, oh, you do? Oh, there? there is a grand master plan where sort of a, even little tiny threads I left dangling in earlier books all end up being woven into a conspiracy spanning decades, as, as I think is how we cooked it up in the marketing copy. Oh, wow. uh, so I've got this, these amazing characters. We've got all this wonderful Skylar lore. We've got the 20s. We've got a really kind of compelling nail-biting mystery that happens on the high seas uh, in this book because this tells the story of prohibition from the standpoint of all these people who are uh, you know, bringing in contraband running things in, from over running, running in, yeah. the rum runner side of things. So. Very nail-biting, emotional climax uh, at the end of this book. So, so is I this going to be the summer book? Will the summer book, or is it going to be another standalone? Or is so, it be so that if you know, obviously we are looking into the future here. But I certainly do have a third. We haven't mm -hmm. written it yet or anything. It would probably again slot into an off-season. Off it would season not right. be 
uh, a summer book for me. So when, okay, so when you're doing this, do you have, so you say you have the, all these threads in your head, do you write down all these? Do you have no. this? No. It's just I, in your head. It's so funny. I have a hard time remembering people's names now, mm. but all these ideas are kind of all in my head. Uh, my dad's an, and I think I, I get, my dad's an engineer, mm. so I, it's almost like a set of blueprints in my head, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, maybe that's just a natural way for me to think. And wait, you I do scribble stuff down sometimes, but more to just lock it in than to... And you did not study writing to. before. Remind me what your previous well, career I was. Did. It, I did. I was, I was in business. You were in I, business. I got an MBA in yes. finance from Columbia, just right uptown. Uh, and but that's the way you also were thinking. You I, weren't think, thinking like that? Well, you no, know, I actually, I, I got my MBA, I think, because I wanted to succeed in something that was much easier than succeeding at writing. Mm. Writing is very hard, uh, and your chances for success are very slim. If you go out and get an MBA, your chances of success are much higher. Your <laughs> chances of getting a job are and, much higher. And you can pay back your student loans. It has many <laughs> advantages. Uh, but... You know, certainly for somebody like me who had, oh, I mean, since the time I was three years old and my mom taught me to read, I've always wanted to write books. Uh, mm. It was a, it's been a passion of mine. So I was the only, certainly, I'm pretty sure I was the only one in my MBA class at Columbia who was reading, uh, you know, Anthony Trollope in between <laughs> yeah, study I'm sure sessions. You were. I'm sure so you were. it was always my passion. It was always what I really wanted to do, but I was too scared to do it. Mm. Uh, you know, I was just like, gosh, what if I don't succeed in this one thing? that I want the most, that I love the most, which is writing. So to say that I didn't, st I, I didn't sort of formally study it in that sense because I, I, was, I was scared. Right. Uh, and it was after I had kids that I was like, okay, now I, even if I crash and burn as a writer, my kids still need me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, I still succeed as a mom. <laughs> exactly, my kids will still love me, you know. Right. So the stakes weren't quite as existentially high for me now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that gave me the courage to go out there and raise my flag and say, okay, everybody, I want to be a writer. Uh, and 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 then go off, and, and then I, I did a lot of workshops and really studied the, and I continue to study the craft. Mm -hmm. Constantly, I'm always trying to make myself a better writer and a better storyteller. And always see what people are writing because mm -hmm. the trends change as well. Oh, yeah. And what's happening is changing. And historical fiction written in dual narrative has become a it has. big, big it's, thing at this point. Yes, you know? it has. It's yeah. become, um, it's not, and I'm not saying a formula, but it's been something that's accepted by readers. Though I do hear from readers, and I don't find this when I'm reading your mm -hmm. books, that people can get lost. Yes. Because they, like, especially if they're listening on audio, I yes. hear this a lot, that you they said you can't narrators. go back, you need a good narrator, but you also need, you have very strong storyline and very strong character. Mm -hmm. And where we were talking about before is the voice of the character yes. coming through. I think you can stay in the right time period in your book. Mm -hmm. Other times, I think people can be wishy-washy, yeah. and you're not quite sure of like, wait, which one are we talking about now? Mm -hmm. Where are we? Yeah. And flipping time, zone, time time periods and things like that. It's mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. and I've just heard that feedback from people. Well, you know, it's very interesting. It's something that you, you brought up is, is how much is this is proliferated as a storytelling technique, and why? Because it's very effective, and mm -hmm. particularly if you have this sort of person in the present day who's uncovered a mystery from the past, and so we go back and forth. And it's a very effective narrative technique. Um, but on the one hand, I'm, you know, and, and having done this so much, and I, I you know, I, I like to challenge myself constantly. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I only do it when it's in the service of the book. Uh, you know, my book, A Certain Age, was dual narrative, but it was actually two different points of view happening at the same time. Mm -hmm, it did mm -hmm. not go back and forth uh, between uh, past and present. You know, so I'm always trying to challenge myself and I'm always sort of like, okay, it's got to serve the story. There's got to be a reason you're with doing it. Not just because, oh, the readers get, this is the, the present day narrative is, is the, the, the reader's way in. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's actually kind of condescending to readers. I would like to think that my readers, you know, don't need to have a present day sort of crutch to keep them, you know, Engage to, to keep them engaged in. in the book, um, but you know, a lot of people, um, you know, and I guess it depends on your reading goals. You know, I have had a few people say, "Well, it was just hard to, you know, back and forth." Um, 
but that depends on your and what you're reading for. And if you、mm-hmm. want, if you want a read that's very, very rich and where you do have to think and engage, where it's not just all being delivered to you on a plate, beautifully cooked, where you're part of the sort of、mm-hmm. creation、Discovery. of the story. Because、mm-hmm. I, you know, there's just all these layers there, and and if you're just kind of reading on the surface and you're not engaging yourself in it, you might not be getting everything. And、uh, so I think that it's important that you know. You match the book to the reader. You know, you definitely、mm-hmm. want a reader who wants to have that immersive experience、uh, and wants to engage in the story and the characters and sort of think about what's going on. So, if you were to pick a different time to live in、mm-hmm. besides now, what, do you have a favorite time period that you wish? Wow, that would have been really fun. <laughs> I always have so many qualifiers because I think if you write historical fiction and if you do any kind of historical research or you've even been to a cemetery from a hundred years ago. And you see、uh, how many children's graves there are, right, right. and women of childbearing age as well.、Right. Uh, so uh, I, I think I would have to have a qualifier there about、uh, childhood vaccination and you know anesthetics and right. antibiotics because、right. you know I think those are, I think we we sort of. Forget that in a world without those things, kids died all the time,、right. and women died in childbirth all the time. So、um, there are a lot of motherless if, if children. If we can set、yeah. all that aside, so our tendency is to romanticize the past, and we、mm-hmm. forget that our ancestors were living under a constant mantle of grief and anxiety、uh, because life was so tenuous and、mm-hmm. so fragile,、uh, and we sort of, I think, forget that. So. If I set all that aside, because that takes all the fun out of the question,、uh, I, I mean the 1920s is to me, I, I wouldn't say, it, but there's so much change going on、uh, during that time period. I、yes. think,、uh, and and the、so、other thing was, it's like exactly. <laughs> well, I, I think that would have to be another qualifier. But I think if you wanted wine, <laughs> you figure in it the、out. 20s, it was pretty easy to get your hands on some,、uh, and and actually that's part of the fun of it is the stories about how. People、the depth, the depth、yeah. that people went to do this. Yeah, exactly. My father-in-law loves to tell the story about,、uh, you know, the these sort of parents of friends of his. This is way back in the way back, but they literally sort of in the in the year between the constitutional amendment being ratified and the actual implementation of the Volstead Act, which sort of provided for the sort of the legal framework of prohibition. He, they literally bought up a liquor store, the entire <laughs> contents of a liquor store, and put it down in the cellar to last them basically till kingdom come, and、uh, and 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 they were like still drinking this liquor like by the sixties. So.、Uh, It just shows the desperation that was happening there. But you know, so so much is going on,、mm-hmm. and、um, there is also a sort of that sort of post World War One thing that is happening, which is、uh, we're a bit unmoored.、Mm-hmm. Uh, there is this sense that everything that we believed in, all these sort of steady foundations of you know of civilization, had sort of crumbled. Mm-hmm. During the First World War,、mm-hmm. uh, these things that we were supposed to believe in,、uh, what just God would allow a war as sort of senseless and pointless as this, so many people killed, so much grief,、uh, and 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 just various other aspects of the war really sort of shook our belief in、uh, in 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 family and in government and in education and religion, all these things. So the 1920s are a reaction to that. So there's this sort of endless, sort of frenetic search for something you can count on, and all they ended up doing was just having, trying to party a lot, and、right. and sort of well amusement or self focus on the self, you know, because you can't count on anything else. All this stuff is going on. I think it'd be really fascinating to be in that period and and the fun aspect, but also there's a kind of a sad brittleness to it as well.、Um, so it's, to me, it's a very very fascinating decade. It's 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 a little harder to get readers on board because it's not as clear cut. You don't have this great narrative of good versus evil that's happening、right. that is just draws people in and is very compelling. Uh, it's a much more nuanced, complicated thing going on in the 1920s, and I feel like the 20s and the 50s are sort of kind of mirrors of one another in, in some ways. ways, not in all ways,、yeah. but in many ways because it was once again a war was over, and there was a lot of change going on、There's、at the same time. But we don't have. We've already had what happened in World War One behind us, so、yeah. it's like you, you already saw it could happen again.、You've、it could. It could happen again, and I think the difference is that in the 1920s. 
we wanted everything to change because the experience had been so horrible. In the 1940s, everything had been horrible, but we wanted to kind of try and find a way to go back to the way things were mm -hmm. before all the change started. And of course, you know, that's impossible. It's a little bit of what my book, um, The Summer Wives, is about is sort of this sort of desperate trying, sort of clinging to um, old traditions uh, <laughs> and, and it's sort of a discovery that in mm -hmm. fact, the world has moved on and that you mm -hmm. can't just sort of, uh, you know, continue to, to sort of to go back to the way things were. It's mm -hmm. impossible. That sort of door has closed. No, the door's closed. Lives have changed in dramatic ways. And, and society has changed. Civilization has changed. And Technology. Yes. Everything. And then you go through forward to today. Yes. So in, in addition to writing solo, <laughs> you also write with the writing team. It's Team W, yes. and it is you along with Karen White and Lauren Willig. And this is the book that you've got coming in January, yes. which is All the Ways We Said Goodbye. Right? Yes, we and it are. And set at the Ritz Hotel, do I hear? So it's partly set at the Ritz in Paris. Uh, I can't remember the exact genesis of this idea, uh, but... We were so, and when we after our we wrote our first book, uh, and I think we at this point had sort of were outlining uh, our second book, The Glass Ocean, the Glass Ocean which too. just no, came, okay. it, the paperback Five edition uh, just came out. Yep, and that's set on board the Lusitania, uh, which uh, was torpedoed as we know by a German uh, U-boat in 1917, and was one of the catalysts that brought America into the First World War. So we were sort of like, well, obviously this is going to be a thing. We've got to keep doing this. We really love writing together so much. It's truly the joy of our creative lives. Uh, so we thought, well, you know, what about if we, so I think we had some nebulous idea that if we set a book in the Paris Ritz, we could justify actually going there together for research. And unfortunately, uh, between family commitments and work commitments, that never actually happened. Uh, but the idea was there, and so we set a book around three different generations of women uh, in France uh, in, during the First World War, uh, during the Second World War, uh, and then in the 1960s when a widow uh, comes to Paris to sort of find out the truth of her husband's experience with the resistance during the war. And so when you were writing this, okay, so what you do is you get an idea, mm -hmm. you, you percolate the idea together yes. on a writing trip, a very serious writing trip with Oh, wine. yes, yes. A very serious uh, writing we trip. We really, we try to do it without any kind of luxuries or right. uh, yeah. exactly whatsoever. Just so getting away for a writing trip craft. together, away from the family because we must yes. go work together. We, we sacrifice for you our sacrifice art. For yes. your art. You sacrifice you for your to, art. You sacrifice for your art. We call ourselves the unibrain because... Uh, it, we just, we, it's almost like we share a brain. Mm -hmm. uh, we're constantly in our text chats just like, you know, you know, jinxing each other, saying the exact same thing at the same time. Uh, we, we just, even though it's interesting because we write three, kind of really different, they're very- Three they different are, books. Very, really very three different, different books, yeah. so three different writing styles. Yep. And yet it all comes together when we write these novels and people literally cannot tell which of us, my husband can tell. Because uh, he can hear, he knows which he, voice is mine. Oh, it's like your child that? crying in a nursery, I guess. But, uh, but you know, but even our editor can't tell who wrote which narrative. And so, that's part of the secret is you don't share that. We don't part of the share secret that is knowledge. You don't share who wrote exactly. which. Exactly. So it it takes place with three narratives. Um, we each take one character. But what we do is we go on a writing retreat and we sit down. And this is not something we do with our standalone books. Uh, we do some general outlining, uh, all three of us, when we do our standalone books uh, on, by, on our own. But when we write together, we do do a detailed chapter by chapter outline. Uh, and through the entire book, beginning to end, that we create together. So these characters, um, the, the plot, uh, mm -hmm. and even the sort of the more detailed granular plot level, we do all together, brainstorming, writing it down, you know, and uh, so that when we go to write and we go home, we finish this outline up and we go back home to our respective, uh, Karen's in Atlanta, I'm in Connecticut, uh, Lauren's in New York City. And then whoever has that, you know, that first character with the first chapter writes that chapter according to the outline, uh, sends it to the person who writes the next chapter, who then reads chapter one, then writes chapter two, 
then maybe I'll get it, I'll read chapter one and two, and then write my chapter three, and then it goes back to, uh, to the first narrative again. And so we do that sort of round robin, and we're reading what the other person wrote mm -hmm. uh, before we write our own chapter. And we're referring to this outline and these characters that we all brainstorm created together uh, so that there's, there is that incredible seamlessness to it. Uh, it's just sort of sharing the, the, the writing chore. The whole thing together. Exactly. It's, but And do you find that having that roadmap makes it easier to write? It makes it so much easier. And if I could do that with for my own books, I would. But I don't have two other brains helping me. Right. So <laughs> when we're doing this detailed plot outline, we're figuring out what doesn't work along the way. Whereas I have to actually write my own stuff and be like, oh, wait, this doesn't work. You know, I'd be like, right. darn it, if only I'd thought of that before I wrote that. And you talk in between if you're stuck, like oh, if you're in the constantly. middle of a chapter yes. or you yes. say you're like, going, wait, I'm oh, stuck. Oh, wait a minute, we have a problem because this wouldn't have happened or I don't feel like this character would have done this. And we immediately talk it out. We have this joke that we don't argue, and it's true. We mm. really, um, I think that we respect each other so much and each other's opinions that we sort of, it's, you know, I wish we could sell this to corporations because it's, it's amazing huge. how we resolve conflict in a completely conflict-free way. Right. Uh, you know, I, we spoke with Karen a couple of months ago, and she said the same thing. And it's very interesting, I think, and empowering that three women mm -hmm. can do this because a lot of times there's some kind of animosity that's set up. There's some kind of a friction that's set up. And there's and this, this whole is, stereotype, yeah. It's a whole stereotype yeah. of what goes on. And also, it's like, you know, three is a very, it's the odd number. Yeah, exactly. And yet the three of you, and I've seen you mm -hmm. more than once, you know, in, in uh, talks or whatever, it's more like you empower each other. And it's yes. incredibly interesting to see people who want to succeed individually which every each of you are very you know much into that but also succeeding as a group and being Absolutely. happy for each other it's we totally incredible. are uh, you know i think and that's kind of the attitude you really i think it's it would be tough to go into that situation if you didn't already have a wonderful friendship where you love and support each other to begin with mm -hmm. uh you know our reason for writing this is partly to be able to further that friendship and have these almost excuses uh, for to us to together. get together and further our friendship. So it's been wonderful on so many levels. Our friendship is just a million times deeper and richer than it was uh, before we started. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just been an amazing experience to see just what we're capable of as, mm -hmm. as human beings. And I just, I honestly... You know, this is a tough business, uh, and there's a lot of arbitrary stuff going on, and uh, and I think it is so good to have two, at least two people out there, you know, who completely have your back. And they you can say understand anything to them. what you're going through. If you're saying they're going, where we get discussion about this, yeah. you can at least run it by somebody yeah. who's like, in the loop and knows you. I can't tweet about this, but I can <laughs> go on my text chat with Karen and Laura and exactly. and hash it out with them. So yeah. uh, it's really it's it's been a wonderful experience, and I I just could not do it without them. And this book, you know, I hate to sound like I'm like plug plug plugging it, but we finished this going. We really, I mean, this is truly our best. If you loved our previous two books, this one, it's just a, that next level. Uh, I think that it. now yeah. that we have worked together twice, and this is the third time, the characters we created, there was such magic going on while we were creating the story. And then the writing, when the characters came to life on the page, it was just such a joy to get those chapters in in my inbox and be like, oh, you know, I can't wait to see what Karen and Lauren have done with their characters. And these three characters are so vivid and vibrant. The emotional um, depth and richness of this book is just that like next level. Uh, I am so excited for readers to get their hands on this. It's really I'm looking forward to reading it because I really enjoyed the Glass Ocean. I uh, really, really did. Oh well, yeah, you're going to even love like, this. And we had we do have a couple of characters oh, who we'll have we'll crossed through. over. Yes, which was a lot of fun. And there's a major character in this book who's going to be like the main character in Karen's next standalone that, book. So yeah, uh, so there are these little tie-in exactly. things, little red things going so, throughout. So yes. So if um, when you're naming characters, do you three of you just decide what the names are going to be? Do you play with yes. that? Yes. We that's, play with, yeah, I mean, we, that's, that's almost one of the easier decisions yeah. just because um, there's this great resource, you know, the, the Social Security most popular baby names of 1923, <laughs> you know, so you go through and you're like, okay, this one looks good. That's right, because the names of your characters, they're all period correct as well. Yes, like, and you yeah. have to go back to, well, what would not, you know, a character, what, what are the 
popular baby babies in 1940. No, you have to go back to the decade in which your character would have been born, born right. and find out what people were naming their kids. That's so. going to be really interesting when you get to the 2019. I know, <laughs> I know right? Totally. <laughs> so, a um, couple of years ago, I heard uh, Megan Abbott talking mm -hmm. about writing when she was writing on The Deuce for mm -hmm. HBO, and they were yeah. in a writer's room, and yeah. they were all writing together. Yeah. And she was going to go home, and she was going to start writing by herself. And she, I um, can't remember which of the writers that was in the room said to her, when you go home, just get back in your own head and do it. Yeah. Because you're so used to being with other people. Yes. When you are now writing your solo books, mm -hmm. do you find that there is a shift that you've got to make because now you're back alone in your head? You're uh -huh. not dealing with the unibrain? Well, the, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, and, and, and it, I do have access to Karen and Lauren if I get really stuck. Right. Uh, and we have often had these things like, okay, I'm stuck in my book and let's talk it over and we do that together. Uh, it is very helpful to have, to be plotting something out with two other characters. But, and, and I don't know much about writing rooms, but I mean, we, we are writing our chapters by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing my chapter in all the ways we said goodbye, I'm, I'm sitting in my chair like I would write my standalone book. Uh, it's just that I happen to have this very helpful chapter outline in front of me, so I know what I'm <laughs> writing that somebody day. Somebody else wrote exactly. that you can read. Yeah. Exactly. So it's that's very helpful. But it's not. I don't think it's quite the same as being in a writer room because uh, at the end of the day, you are the sole person writing mm -hmm. that chapter. Uh, but you just happen to have. And you have to the agree. It's all, yeah, it's all laid out. You know what you're going to write, which is I think the, the challenge when I'm writing by myself. I'm like. Oh boy, what's this chapter going to be? <laughs> you know, where yeah. am I going next? And in the writer room, you're actually you're there's a general contractor, but you yeah. might only be painting like the the trim, yeah. and you might only be doing the dialogue. Yeah. I've and have all this fancy storyboarding and everything going on, and totally different. Yeah. I have a friend who only writes chase scenes. That's yeah. what he does. He writes really great chase scenes, and that wow. is like you can bring him in on a movie and say you can write the chase, chase scene, scene because it's you can actually visualize because that's a very different way of writing than straight narrative. Totally. When I have so. to write the there's like highly choreographed scenes. I'm like, I just want to go back to when people are talking. You know? Yes, can I just go do that? Getting, them from po getting people from point A to point B I without know. falling the in the water. The choreography, oh my God. And what like, to yeah. do. Yeah. So besides all everything else that you're doing, you're raising a family. You have four children. Yes. Which I always find astounding is you have four children. Do you write like at a certain time of day and then quit? And then can you just stop your brain? Because I'm very bad at stopping my brain. I can ask my husband. I very think bad. the hardest thing is not stopping my brain, but starting my brain. I think that mm. when you have kids, you have so much mental load. Mm -hmm. uh, it is sometimes, and, and I do, you have to be very disciplined. Uh, because you do only have these certain hours of the day when you can write. And um, I think, and I, I don't want to sort of open this whole can of worms about, you know, men's and women's roles and so on. Mm -hmm. But by and large, I think women do carry most of the mental load, uh, you know, not the sort of vacuum. It's not the vacuuming or the, the long or, or the carpool it. or anything. It's, it's, it's like, just the, like, okay, I'm going to the grocery store. What am I going to make for dinner this week? And what is so-and-so going to need their thing for soccer? And the There's all this sort of planning that has to go on that mm -hmm. is the mental load. And... Uh, and all the thousand and one things you need to worry about and be on top of. And I'm, by the way, not naturally good at that anyway. So being able to set that aside and then focus on your fictional world and plunge yourself into that, uh, despite the thousand and one things niggling the back of your head, that is the challenge mm -hmm. uh, and, and getting into it. And sometimes it, it's very frustrating to be like, oh, shoot, it's 3 o'clock. I have to stop now. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I, I think it's actually the harder part is just getting in every day mm. and, 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 and plunging into that world. And if you have to stop early, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's, that's not the sort of mental challenge of it, mm -hmm. I think. Because your brain just continues to work on it and then suddenly you get all these new ideas. You know, It's not like you're stuck just because your fingers aren't typing. It's right. not that you're not working in the back of your head. Yeah, you're playing around with it. Like, oh, where yeah. am I gonna go? What Absolutely. are we gonna do? Because you can't just sit there and type the whole time. The, the whole thinking aspect of writing takes a great deal more time than the actual typing of sentences. Right, how are we actually gonna pull this all together? And sometimes, mm -hmm. what I find is if I have a project that we're working on, I will be someplace else. Like when yes. I speak the kids' baseball games, yeah. I could sit there and think something through yeah. because I'm not yes. in the place. Yes. I'm not staring at the computer that I've got to come oh. up with this idea. And I've come up with ideas on airplanes. Oh, Some yeah. of my best thinking has been done in the places where... Well, I go I, running like, in the morning, yes. for oh, example. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah. 
I used to swim in Fully the morning. Laundry. And it was like great. Yeah, and you're just your brain is on well, your something very on autopilot. rote. Yeah, you're doing something very very rote, but yes. at the same time, this is what I'm going to be working on. What I'm going to yeah. be doing. Yeah. Well, what you're doing is working. So Thank we're you. really, really glad about that. And I love point, what I do. I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to do this. At some point, the fourth child will go away to college, and then you're going to be sitting there thinking about who's calling me from home, and you're calling home, and other things like that. Exactly. So, it's always something, but uh, always something. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so such much a pleasure. for having me. I'm so excited to be in the book recorder offices. And, uh, <laughs> so much fun with our backdrop here. I love us. it. I know. I want to like, why? Do not turn your backs because I'll be putting that into my tote bag. Just put there and see what take with uh, us. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time.